This is a revision video for the final topic in GCSE Combined Science, or the penultimate one if you're taking GCSE Physics, which is the magnetism and electromagnetism topic. 40% of all of the marks in GCSE Science are for recalling facts that are written down for you in the specification. So this video is to allow you to check that you do actually know those facts. There's a link in the description below to a worksheet which includes all of the questions in this video so that you can attempt them on your own and then use this video to check your answers. The places where the forces acting are strongest are called the poles, and the two types of pole are a north pole and a south pole. Two magnets will exert a force if they're sufficiently close together, and if you bring together two like poles, in other words north and north or south and south, they will repel each other, whereas two opposite poles will be attracted together. Magnetic forces are non-contact forces, and what that means is that the magnetic field is the area around a magnet where a magnetic material like iron or cobalt or nickel will experience a force. The closer that metal is to the magnet, the greater the size of the force will be. And the strongest force is found at the poles of the magnet. Magnetic field lines always have arrows that show that they go from the north seeking pole to the south seeking pole. In order to plot the magnetic field of a bar magnet, we need a small compass called a plotting compass. This contains a north seeking magnet, so left to its own devices, that arrow will point towards geographical north, but when we introduce a bar magnet, instead it will respond to the magnetic fields of that magnet. So the first thing that we need is a piece of paper to put our magnet on. And then we're going to move this plotting compass around the magnet. So you place it down close to the magnet, and what you do is you look at the positioning of that arrow and you draw a mark on the piece of paper to show you where was the arrow pointing when it was that close to the magnet. Then you're going to take your plotting compass and you're going to move it around the magnet and each time that you move it you write down which direction was the arrow pointing. Then you join together all of those arrows and you add arrows that go from north to south to show which direction the field lines were going. So firstly we need our bar magnet and there are a couple of things to bear in mind as you're drawing your field lines. The first one is that your magnet is going to have field lines that always go from the north to the south. The colour isn't super important and obviously you're not going to be able to do this in an exam but it just makes more sense in my head. And then the second thing that you need to bear in mind is that the, um, the field lines are going to be closest together nearest to the poles because that's where they are strongest. So you can think of them a bit like um, map lines on an ordnance survey map. The closer together they are, the steeper the hill is. And I need to add some arrows in to show that these are all going from north to south. And it's important that that's the same on both sides of the diagram. Um, we aren't drawing um, a circle here where everything goes clockwise or everything goes anti-clockwise. Um, we're actually always going from north to south and eventually you'll reach the point where some of these field lines aren't actually going to connect up they sort of go off the diagram so you have some unconnected lines as well but again these are always going out from north and in to south out from north and into south and at either end you're going to have one line that definitely doesn't connect to anything it just goes out from north and into south. When a current flows through a conducting wire, or indeed any conductor, whether it's a wire or not, this is going to cause a magnetic field to be produced around the wire. And if you imagine that your current is going from the bottom to the top, then in that case our magnetic field is going to curl around that wire in an anti-clockwise direction. You can predict this using the right hand rule. So this is where your thumb is the direction of the current going from your hand up to the ceiling and then your fingers as they curl around represent the magnetic field. The strength of the field around the wire will be controlled by two things. Firstly, the size of that current, so the bigger the current is, the stronger the magnetic field will be, and then also the distance from the wire. So just like with a bar magnet, the further you get away from that wire, the less of a magnetic force a magnetic object will experience. A solenoid is a loop of wire that's been curled around and around and around to make a sort of spring shape, and as long as it's carrying current, it will function as a magnet. 
The purpose of creating that solenoid is that you're lining up the field lines and therefore you're creating a magnet that's much more powerful than a single straight wire on its own would be. Inside that solenoid, the magnetic field is uniform and it is strong. But if we add an iron core to it, then we can make it even stronger. When we add that iron core to the solenoid, now we call this an electromagnet. And the advantage of an electromagnet is that you can switch it on and off. And this is very useful if you're looking at an industry, something like a scrapping yard, where you might want a very powerful magnet to pick up a car, but then you need to be able to put the car down again. So you need to be able to turn off that magnet. Building an electromagnet is fairly straightforward. As we've just said, an electromagnet is just a solenoid, so a coil of wire that has an iron core inside it. So your first step is to wrap a wire multiple times around some kind of iron core. And often in school, we use a nail for this. Then you need to connect those wires to a power supply and switch the power supply on. Then we need to think about how we could test the strength of this electromagnet. And we tend to do this by trying to pick up paper clips. So one way is that you could test and see how many different paper clips your electromagnet can pick up. And obviously it goes without saying that the more paper clips you can pick up, the stronger your electromagnet is. Alternatively, you could clamp your electromagnet at different distances away from a paper clip on the table and see how far away can you move that electromagnet and still attract that paper clip. Again, it kind of goes without saying, but not in your exam, because you need to make sure that you say everything explicitly, that the further away you can move that electromagnet and still pick up a paper clip, the stronger the electromagnet is. Now, this question doesn't explicitly say about changing anything, but you might be asked in an exam style question about how you could make that electromagnet stronger and how you could use this testing to show that it's stronger. So there are two key ways. One would be adding more coils to the electromagnet and the other would be by increasing the amount of current. And either of those should give you a stronger electromagnet. Obviously, if you're going to do this, you need to test both before and after you make the change. So you test with five coils of wire and then you test with 10 coils of wire and you show that, oh, look, the one that has 10 coils of wire is actually a stronger electromagnet. You might also want to mention the fact that the paper clips should be demagnetized because depending on what they're made of, they may retain some magnetic field from a previous experiment with the electromagnet. If you're taking the foundation tier exams for the combined science papers, then that's everything that you need to know for magnetism and electromagnetism. But for the rest of us, there are a few more questions. The motor effect tells us that where a conductor that currently has current passing through it, so in other words, a wire that's part of a live circuit, passes through a magnetic field, both the magnet and the conductor are going to experience a force. This can be described using Fleming's left hand rule. In order to carry out this rule, you need to have the thumb and the first two fingers of your left hand at 90 degrees from one another. The thumb represents the direction of the motion or the force that is going to be experienced. The first finger represents the field and the second finger represents the current. The magnetic field, as always, moves from north to south and the current goes from positive to negative. Remember, we're thinking about conventional current, not the movement of electrons, even though we know that these are opposite to one another. To calculate the size of the force experienced, we use the equation F equals BIL. In other words, force is magnetic flux density multiplied by current multiplied by length. The force is, of course, in newtons. Magnetic flux density is measured in teslas. Current is, of course, measured in amps or amperes and length is measured in metres. A motor is made from a coil of wire which is carrying current in a magnetic field. So here's my coil of wire and as you can see there is the current moving around it in a circle so always moving from positive to negative and this is placed in a magnetic field. So this is made either from a sort of u-shaped magnet or from two separate static magnets so we have north and south. This is going to cause that coil of wire to rotate. And in order to make this rotation continue always in one direction, rather than flip flopping back and forth between it, we need a split ring commutator. When the motor is turned on, the coil of wire is experiencing the motor effect. But because the current is moving around in a circle, so on the left side of my coil, it's moving away from me and on the right side, it's moving towards me. 
the force felt by the two sides of that coil is going to be opposite to each other. So the left side is going to be pushed down, whereas the right side is going to be pushed up. And this leads to rotation. When a conductor that doesn't already have an electrical current passing through it passes through a magnetic field, this does induce a current. And where a magnetic field is changing around a conductor, this can induce a potential difference. An alternator is built based on this. So basically we have a coil of wire which is being rotated in a magnetic field. Because that coil of wire is cutting through the magnetic field, and of course as a wire it's a conductor, this induces current in the coil as it rotates. Slip rings are used to make sure that there is continuous current with an external circuit. And this means that the current can flow from the rotating coil to the external circuit. This generates alternating current. The basis for a dynamo is similar to an alternator. It also involves a coil of wire that is rotated in a magnetic field. And because it's still a coil of wire and it's still being rotated in a magnetic field, this still induces a current in the coil as it rotates. But rather than using the slip rings, this time a split ring commutator connects the coil to the external circuit. And this means that rather than generating alternating current as an alternator does, a dynamo generates direct current. The construction of a transformer is actually quite straightforward and it only involves three key parts. So our first part in the centre of the transformer is a laminated iron core. It's important that the core is made of a magnetic material because in order for it to work, it's going to need to have a magnetic field induced in it. And it's laminated because this reduces eddy currents and those would decrease the efficiency of the transformer. So on the left side of the transformer, we have a primary coil of wire. And then on the right hand side, we have a secondary coil of wire. And each one of these coils needs to be insulated. And this is important because while we want to induce a current in the secondary coil, we don't want that current to actually be flowing through the iron core because in that case the transformer wouldn't work. So we need some way of making sure that the current that has um, been introduced in the primary coil doesn't just flow straight through into the secondary coil. A step up transformer is going to increase the potential difference or you might call it a voltage of the power supply, whereas a step down transformer is going to decrease the potential difference. The way that this is brought about is by looking at the number of coils. So what I've drawn here is a step up transformer. And you can tell this because while there are three coils on the primary side, there are six on the secondary side. So in this instance, this would um, double the potential difference of my power supply. If I wanted to make a step down transformer, this would have fewer secondary coils than primary coils. The first thing you need to understand about the national grid is that the power is supplied is dictated by the demand. So in other words, people in their homes and factories need a certain amount of electricity and that power demand can't be changed by the people who are generating that electricity. They just have to meet it. Now, we know that power can be calculated by multiplying together current and potential difference. So in other words, if I need to produce a certain amount of power, I have two options. I could have a very high current or I could have a very high potential difference. And as one of those increases, the other one can decrease. Now, if I have a high current, this leads the wires to heat up because the resistance increases because the electrons are moving faster. So this means that high current leads to heat losses, and that's obviously very inefficient and it's going to involve a waste of money. So it's ideal for the power companies if the current is as high as possible. However, when we get to people's houses, if we have a very high potential difference, which is what we would need to have in order to get the current down, that high potential difference is very hazardous to people. So it's not possible for us to just have the whole power network running on very, very high potential difference. So what we do is we use step up transformers in order to step up the potential difference to the start of the national grid. And that means that the current can be very low and the heat losses can be very low. And then before we get to domestic users, we step down the potential difference using step down transformers. And this means that the domestic supply can be 230 volts, which is much safer.
So the transformer is made from this laminated iron core with the primary coil on one side and the secondary coil on the other side. And the first thing that is really important that you understand about how this transformer works is that it only works because the alternating potential difference causes there to be an alternating current and that alternating current causes there to be an alternating magnetic field. So this won't work if you have a power supply, which is direct current. It needs that alternating power supply. So the whole process starts with an alternating potential difference, which causes there to be an alternating current in the primary coil. As you know, when a current flows through a conductor, this induces a magnetic field. So because there's that alternating current in the primary coil, this induces an alternating magnetic field in the core. And it's important that you specify that this is happening in the core, in the iron core. So it's not the current that's moving through that central bit of iron, it's the magnetic field. Now, just as a current can induce a magnetic field, a magnetic field can induce a current. And this is only going to work because the magnetic field is fluctuating. So because there's that alternating magnetic field in the core, this induces an alternating current and therefore an alternating potential difference in the secondary coil. We can calculate the potential difference on the secondary coil by using the fact that the ratio between the potential difference on the primary coil and the secondary coil will be the same as the ratio between the number of coils on the primary coil and the secondary coil. So for instance, let's say that we had a primary coil potential difference of 100 volts, and then we had a primary number of coils that was 50, and our secondary coil had 200. Now the ratio here is 50 to 200, which can be simplified as one to four. So that would mean that if my primary coil had a potential difference of 100, I can multiply by four to get a potential difference of 400 volts. If on the other hand, I had a step down transformer, maybe I have a primary coil which has 400 coils on it, and I have a secondary coil which only has 80 coils on it. That's a ratio of 400 to 80 which can be simplified as a five to one. So in that instance, I would need to divide by five or times by a fifth, depending on how you prefer to think about. It. And so that would give me a secondary potential difference of 20 volts. Sound waves are caused by vibrations and it's the frequency of those vibrations that determines the pitch of the sound. Those sound waves are able to cause the diaphragm of the microphone to vibrate with the same frequency as the sound wave. That diagram in turn causes a wire coil inside the microphone to vibrate as well. The wire coil is of course made from a conductor and that conductor is moving through the magnetic field lines. As you know, when we have a conductor moving through magnetic field lines, that's going to induce a current and therefore if it's changing a potential difference. So this induces a potential difference across the ends of the coil. The variations in that pressure that's caused by the sound waves can then be converted into variations in potential difference. Thank you very much for watching, and I hope you're now feeling more confident in your knowledge about magnetism and electromagnetism. If you did find it useful, then let me know in the comments below, and don't forget to like and subscribe for more GCSE physics videos coming soon.